Remember that one of the observations that Darwin made that, that allowed him to come to the conclusions that he did in his book On the Origin of Species was the observation of domestic animals in his native England. He looked around and saw that animals varied to a large extent in their phenotype and he wondered why that was and he came to the conclusion that that was the result of humans selecting for certain traits that they liked. For instance, if we look at dogs, so here we see on this top tier um, that uh, humans at one point decided that they wanted short dogs uh, that were fairly long in uh, stature. And then if we look at the second tier here, so they've selected for short, long dogs, and, and they've gotten a little bit shorter and a little bit longer. And as time goes on, of course this would take longer than four generations, but after hundreds or thousands of generations, you end up with dachshunds, these dogs, hot dog dogs, these dogs that are extremely long with very, very short legs. Uh, nothing like their wolf-like ancestors, uh, but the result of, of intensive selective breeding over long periods of time. And so you can look at this as a test for natural selection. Natural selection does the same thing except the environment is doing the selecting. You can ask the question if we impose a selective pressure on a group of organisms for a long period of time, does that change the phenotype of the organism? And the answer, if we look at the results of artificial selection, is obviously yes. We can also test natural selection in a laboratory setting. And so this can be done in a, in a fairly simple um, scenario. This is a two-year study, um, but um, it can be done even over a shorter period of time if you use an organism that has a shorter uh, lifespan uh, or uh, life uh, cycle. So fruit flies have about a two-week life cycle or so. Fruit flies are the flies that you fl find in your kitchen flying around your fruit that's been sitting around too long. And here we see uh, fruit flies on the uh, screen and what we see in this particular uh, e experiment is this. We start out with the fruit flies at generation one and so imagine we have one group of fr fruit flies and we take them and we expose them. We divide them into two groups and we expose them to alcohol and on the y-axis here we have a percent of population that metabolized alcohol, just ethanol. Fruit flies can be grown very easily in a little culture vial. We grow them sometimes in, in ecology and environmental science labs uh, on Asbury's campus. And so you'll notice at generation one, so pay close attention to the graph, generation one, remember these are one group of flies that are split into two. So it makes sense that their tolerance for ethanol will be the same. Generation one in both cases, in both groups here, was only about 10% of those flies could rapidly metabolize alcohol. Now, over the next 57 generations, which equals two years in terms of um, actual time that, that has passed, then in this group of fruit flies, the one on the right, we expose them to a media or a food source that has a high percentage of alcohol in it. And then over here on the right, we just we don't expose these flies. This is our control group. We do not expose them to alcohol. At the end of 57 generations, we test the tolerance of the fruit flies for, uh, for alcohol once again. And what we see here is that the control group, as we would expect, hasn't changed at all. Still about 10% of the flies can metabolize alcohol rapidly. But in the fruit flies that have been exposed to the, the alcohol, then almost 100% of them can uh, metabolize alcohol. And so this is an example of, of natural selection. And it's very simple. The organ, the fruit flies that couldn't metabolize alcohol died, and the ones that could, about 10% initially in the population, reproduced. And so you have this shift as a result of natural selection because it's imposed by the environment. It's a selective pressure imposed by the environment on the flies. And so this is a nice little experiment that demonstrates natural selection over a very short period of time. We want to briefly talk at this point about different types of selection. And we have three different types of selection that we observe in the natural world. Directional selection, stabilizing selection, and diversifying selection. And so th these are all observed, although not at all not all at the same frequency in the natural world. Here is directional selection. Directional selection would be the most common type of selection that we observe. And so what we see is that in directional selection one extreme of the phenotype is being selected for. This is a histogram. So we have the number of individuals that fall into any category, particular category, 
on the y-axis, and then we have color range, in this case, on the x-axis. So a few flowers are pink, a few are bright red, but most are right here in the middle. In directional selection, the pollinators, say the bees, the moths, the hummingbirds, prefer the bright red flowers, and so over a number of generations we have a shift in phenotype from, say, a, a lightish red color here in the middle to a more brighter red color closer to the end, closer to the edge of the color spectrum. So that is directional selection, the most common type of selection we would observe in the natural world. Here we see stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection occurs when the intermediate phenotype is selected for. And so in this case, if we continue with our example, the pink flower and the red flower, neither of those are selected for, but the intermediate, the light red flower, is selected for, and so the, the uh, histogram narrows. Most, while we have some flowers that are pink here and some that are red, there are fewer here. The phenotype narrows in scope. An example, although it's a little disturbing perhaps, of uh, stabilizing selection is birth weight uh, in animals or humans. So a very small animal, very small offspring is, is going to have a disadvantage in surviving. A very large offspring is going to have a survival disadvantage because it's going to have trouble being born. And so the intermediate phenotype is selected for. Uh, in the case of uh, the, the last case that we have is called diversifying selection. And so in diversifying selection, the extreme phenotypes are selected for. The pink and the red are selected for the intermediate phenotype is not selected for. And so what we see is that eventually this leads to a diversification of the phenotype. We have pink flowers, we have red flowers, but we have very few intermediate phenotype flowers. Um, and so this is the, the most least commonly observed type of, of selection in the natural world, but may occur when there are something like two distinct food sources uh, that are available uh, in a particular location. Um, beak size and birds is one example in which this has been observed in the natural world. If there are big seeds and small seeds available but no intermediate sized seeds, then big beaks and small seed beaks will be favored, but intermediate beaks will not be selected for. All right, and so we want to bring this full circle and wrap up our chapter with a discussion uh, of uh, drug resistance in antibiotics. And so we talked about uh, our book starts out this chapter by talk, talking about tuberculosis. And now tuberculosis is, is a, more of a problem today than it has been in the past as a result of, of the resistance of these bacteria to antibiotic therapy. Now let me be specific. What I mean is that tuberculosis is more of a problem today than, than it was 30 years ago, but certainly not 60 years ago. So when antibiotics came along, then it changed things dramatically in the case of tuberculosis and hundreds of other uh, disorders or diseases caused by bacteria. But the problem is that these bacteria have re developed resistance to antibiotics uh, over the, the years and so now some of these diseases are making a comeback. And the idea here is very simple. Um, so here we have lots of different uh, genotypes uh, and phenotypes um, of the uh, tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, the, that particular bacteria, the one that causes tuberculosis, we treat with antibiotics and we see that most but not all of those phenotypes are destroyed by the antibiotics. But the ones that survive are now resistant, or actually they were resistant to begin with, but now the whole population is resistant because the ones that were susceptible have been removed from the population. And so this is the idea of drug resistant um, pathogens. And this is what we see in our world today. We see more and more and more of these bacteria that are resistant uh, to antibiotics. One thing that can be done to, to prevent this is a combination drug therapy. And so the more antibiotics you use, the more likely it is that none of the bacteria will be resistant to all of those different drugs. And so by treating with several different antibiotics, then you can wipe out all the bacteria, leaving no bacteria are remaining that, that are resistant. And so this is a big deal, and one we talked about previously uh, in our class, but you realize that we as humans will have to continue coming up with new antibiotics because 
by the very nature, uh, the, just the, the very nature of using antibiotics makes them less effective because bacteria develop resistance to those antibiotics. And the more they're used, the more resistance develops.